me some start of the show energy for your headliner for tonight. He is a very good friend of mine. He's been on TV, radio. He's a writer, director. We're in a web series together called, Li not even a web series, it's a TV show called Living in Exile. Living in Exile. Please help me welcome Jim Mandrinos. Jim Mandrino. Do me a favor, clap for Lori and all the other comics you saw on the show. Weren't they all great? All right. Let me kind of explain what uh, this part of the show is, because you're all looking up like, whose friend is this fucking guy? And <laughs> none of you. I know none of you fucking people. But um, you'll notice that at this point, they're actually passing around the checks. They did that so they wouldn't pass them out on your friends. It's time for you to look at your checks and then look at me and go, this fucker is not this funny. That's what time it is. <laughs> it's time for you to just judge. That's all I'm saying. How you doing? Doing good? Good. There, there are like three people doing good, and... The rest of you guys kind of got to look like you better be funny in a fucking hurry. That's what you have. Like a really high pressure kind of a look. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't mind pressure, sir. You know I don't mind pressure? Because I drink heavily. That's what I do. I drink. I, uh, I've been drinking since 1971. And uh, it's amazing because I wasn't even born in 1971. No, I'm lying. I actually was born, but, you know, flashbacks, I don't remember it. And anyway, I... Uh, I used to drink tequila. That was my drink of choice. That's a nasty drink, isn't it? You drink too much tequila, you'll start answering questions nobody even asked you. <laughs> hey, Bob, what time is it? I got four kids. <laughs> and my car's blue. Don't you tell me nothing. <laughs> Women and tequila, that's a lovely mix, isn't it? Ladies, you drink too much tequila, you lose every bit of morality you've ever accumulated. You're pounding on the men's room door like, hey! Somebody fuck me. <laughs> See, the ladies are laughing and guys are looking up like, does that work? It's a, uh, where's that waitress? Nasty drink, man. You drink too much tequila. Next morning, about 10 minutes after you cease vomiting, phone rings. Always a mysterious, yet familiar voice saying something like, dude, you were real fucked up. It's followed by the single most frightening phrase in the English language, you wouldn't believe what you did. Oh, God, I hate that phrase. You know why? Because I know whenever I hear it, I was in my underwear on the table going, I am the walrus goo 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 tube. Because nobody has ever called you up to tell you something nice you did when you were drunk. Just one time I want someone to call me up like, hey, Jim, remember that time you got shit-faced and you painted the orphanage? Mm. Let me ask you this. You ever get so drunk, you wake up the next morning, and you're still wearing the same pants, shirt, and shoes from the night before, but you have absolutely no idea where your underwear went? It's a good night drinking right there. You know what I'm saying? You wake up after search for your delicates. That was one fuck of a party. Where's my underwear? Oh, on the outside. Wow. These aren't even mine. Drunk stories. We all got good drunk stories. Here's the deal in life. You either got a good drunk story or you are someone's drunk story. That's how that shit works. Here's how you can tell. If people chuckle whenever you pick up a beer, <laughs> you the story. Greatest drunk story I ever heard was, uh, was Dennis Rodman. For those of you that don't remember, Dennis Rodman, basketball player, one time got drunk, hopped on a plane, flew to Vegas, and married Carmen Electra. <laughs> Fuck it, he wins. <laughs> you know, I say that, I'll tell you why, because I've been a blackout drunk for most of my adult life, and never, not once, did I ever wake up next to anyone who even remotely resembled Carmen Electra. <laughs> on occasion, I woke up next to people that looked like Dennis Rodman, but... <laughs> This side of the room's liking me more than you people. Have you noticed that? <laughs> side of the room just laughing at my shit. You people looking up like, give us Barabbas. And <laughs> thanks for reading the book over here. <laughs> you know what? Fuck it. They're not even trying. I'll be here the rest of the show. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They just, they weren't there. They were trying, you know, so I give them props for trying, but they just, they're, they're like, my friend's done. I'm out of here. Kind of like what she's doing right now. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm getting a walking ovation. That's amazing. There you go. And I'm not staring at your ass at all, ma'am. No, that's not happening. <laughs> Holy shit, sir. My, my compliments to the chef. Good job. Uh, uh. I'll call you the chef because you should be making soup on that. All right, now. I don't even know what that means, but that sounds foul, doesn't it, sir? That just sounded foul is all I'm saying. You really need to be on the same drugs as I am. Let me just tell you. I am on great drugs. Tonight's drug combination for anybody who's interested is uh, cocaine and Viagra. Yeah. 
I'm going to be up all night. Ha! All right, now. <laughs> and again, apparently that's just for this side of the room. Have you noticed that? <laughs> side of the room getting all the jokes and you people looking up like, there's another one after him, right? No. <laughs> I'm it, fuckers. All right. What the hell were we talking about? I have no idea. So I have no short-term memory left. None. Just none. Not even from drug use. I got it the old-fashioned way, concussion. I get, yeah, I, it, it was amazing because I got a concussion and all the short-term memory went and the doctor said, well, you may not remember shit and it is the greatest fucking excuse of all time. <laughs> My friends are there like, hey, how come you didn't come to my birthday party? Concussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, beat saying your kid's an asshole. All right, welcome back. <laughs> While you were gone, we were all naked. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Weren't we naked people? Yeah. So stand up. Let's see those boobies. Let's go for it. I'll tell you, he was naked, but he left the hat on. That's the only thing I can say about him. Left the hat on. <laughs> he didn't want to go topless. All right, now, I, I am having way more fun than you fuckers. I really am. I like you guys because you're not a room full of hipsters. I'm, I'm very anti-hipster. I hate hipsters. Uh, you know why? Because hipsters want to change shit that does not need to be changed. For instance, a group of young men in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, petitioned our federal government and successfully got them to change the warning label on a pack of cigarettes. You know that warning? It says, warning, cigarettes cause cancer and death, which is really fucking direct, is it not? There is no ambiguity in that whatsoever. Warning, cigarettes cause cancer and death. That is pretty direct, is it not, sir? You know what they changed it to? They got the government to change it, and, and starting in 2017, there is going to be a picture of a corpse on the side of a cigarette packet. Do you know why? Because they were afraid that illiterate people would not know that smoking is bad for you. <laughs> illiterate people. We're trying to keep the illiterate people alive. <laughs> if there is a group of people we need to thin the fucking herd on, it is the non-reading fucktards. It should, it should be, can you read this? Nope, here's a carton. Go for it. There you go. Bring back all the butts and tomorrow you get another carton, all right? You got to bring back all the butts. <laughs> I stopped smoking. You know why? Not for health reasons. Look at me. I clearly don't give a fuck. I, uh, no, honestly, I'm trying to die by Tuesday. I stopped. I stopped because uh, I didn't want to have the discussion with the guy in the bodega anymore because I, I used to smoke Lucky Strike Unfiltered. That's what I used to smoke. And then whenever I'd get there and I'd go to buy cigarettes, the guy would give me a lecture. You know, I'd go down there, i go, let me get a package of Luckies, and the guy would go to me, my friend, let me just say this, if you ever start a conversation with me by using the phrase, my friend, you're not my fucking friend, okay? <laughs> Here's how much I hate that phrase. If you said it to me, I would go on Facebook and unfucking friend you. That is how much. <laughs> He's like, you need to switch to a milder cigarette. I'm like, why? Am I going to get a less aggressive form of cancer? Let me explain how this works. You see, cigarettes are a drug. And when I go to my dealer to buy cocaine, he doesn't try to talk me down to pot. <laughs> Give me the drug I'm asking you for. <laughs> if you people don't like that, we're in for a long four minutes right now. <laughs> Let me just say, this is going to be a bumpy ride for about the next four. Everyone strap on, put your helmet on. This ain't going to be comfortable for any of us. <laughs> All right. I, uh, yeah, this is the whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hipsters fucking ruin everything. Everything. They fucking ruin it. You might be a hipster, and you fucking ruin everything. <laughs> you actually can't be a hipster in a New York Mets jacket. That's, that's a rule of thumb. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but officially today they were eliminated from the playoffs. I am. Um, sometimes. Sometimes it happens before the season begins. I'm sorry. And apparently everyone got Tommy John surgery, <laughs> including the manager. I am. Um, the point I'm making, though, is uh, <laughs> hipsters ruined everything. They did. They ruined everything. Like, they ruined coffee. Yeah. How the fuck do you ruin coffee? Th that used to be the most beautiful drug transaction ever. You wake up in the morning, let me get a large cup of coffee. Here's a dollar. Isn't that not the most beautiful drug transaction ever? Here's a dollar. Here's a liquid cup of fucking happiness. That is just beautiful right there. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they ruined it. The hipsters got a hold of it, made coffee trendy. All of a sudden, we close all the bodegas and little gourmet coffee shops open up. Starbucks open up. Now you can't even get a large cup of coffee anymore. They banished the word large from the language. 
you need to learn a fake fucking language to get your coffee. And ironically, you got to know it before you have any morning coffee in you. That is just fucked up right there. Can I get a large cup of coffee? Do you mean grande? No, I mean big. Can you do that for me? Take a big cup, fill it with coffee. Can you do that, sunshine? What flavor coffee? Can I get the coffee flavor coffee? Why is this an issue? I know you think I'm here for the cafe drinking experience, but let's be honest, it's the last legal drug in America. If it makes you feel better to call yourself a barista instead of a dealer, that's on you. What else did they ruin? They ruined cupcakes. Cupcakes! They fucked with our cupcakes. How do you ruin a cupcake? It is a cake just for you. It combines pastry and selfishness. That is fucking perfect right there. Pastry and selfish. You can't get more American than that. You know how they ruined it? Flavors nobody wants. Care to try a jalapeno cupcake? Fuck you. No, I would not. I prefer not to remember my cupcakes the next morning. This is all I got, folks. I'm not going to break out and I walk the line. This is it. This is what I do. What else do they do? Now they're ruining donuts. Have you noticed that? Little gourmet donut. Right next door to this place, there's a fucking gourmet donut shop. Gourmet donut. There are two words that do not belong together. Next to each other in a sentence, it is fucking gourmet and donut. Do you know what a donut is for? A donut is for three in the morning, you are racked off your fucking ass. And you're there like, I need something so I won't vomit. Donut, good. That's what it is. And now they have these little gourmet donut, like, right next door. First of all, fucking 350 for a donut. 350 for a donut. At 350, the donut better not be the only thing getting glazed in that place. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> better be a little room in the back where I get to put the holes in the donuts, if you know what I'm saying there, sir. <laughs> I think you know what I'm saying. Second of all, look at me. I'm very pro-donut. I don't know if you can tell that about me. Very pro. I will give any donut a shot. And so I go there when it opens up because I want to get a donut. And I go to the guy, and I'm walking in. And there was actually a guy with a clipboard and a velvet rope and a list checking you in to buy a donut. That is how fucking, that is how fucking ridiculous we are as a society now. You need to be on a list to get a donut. <laughs> look at me, people. Clearly, I am on that list. What do you mean I'm not on the list? Check it again. I'm a friend of Jelly's. I'm pretty sure. I am a friend of Jelly's. Check that list. You're going to let the model in? She doesn't even eat donuts. She'll be closed in a week. Fucking let me in. Let me in, you bastard. You fucker. All right. So it's got to start wandering out of here. This is a fun time for me. I'm, uh, I'm newly single again. This is a fun time. Single again is an ugly phrase, though, isn't it? Single again? Ugly phrase, kind of like the cancer came back. Same kind of phrase. Yeah, same kind of phrase. Jim, heard you single again. Yep, thought it was in remission. Turns out. <laughs> By the way, these next three minutes are going to be difficult for some of you people. Uh, uh, not, not that bad. Uh, we're dating. We're dating again. Because I didn't know, I didn't know who to date. Because here's the whole thing: when you're a middle-aged man and you're newly single again. You don't think you should be dating middle-aged women. That's the sad part about that. Do you know what I'm saying, sir? Because you look, you look at women around your own age and you think, no. <laughs> and then you look at women that are much younger than you and they look at you like, no. <laughs> so you're in an awful spot. The, uh, the first woman I went out with after, after the breakup, because I did not date anybody for nine months after the breakup, like very monk-like, didn't want to get my head straight on. You know what I'm saying? Just spent a lot of time alone. And then my friends had an intervention. Like all my male friends one day grabbed me and they took me out to a bar and they, they're sitting me down and they're like, Jim, you need to see somebody. And I'm like, five guys, I don't need therapy. I'm perfectly fine. They're like, no, you need to see a vagina. You are very fucking cranky. <laughs> but still nothing for nine months, nothing. And then after nine months, a, a woman asked me out who was age inappropriate. Like gray area, age inappropriate. Like, not quite old enough to drink in this establishment, but not quite young enough to send my ass to jail for two to five. Do you know that? <laughs> we call that 20. And um, so here's the whole thing. I, I actually went out with her, and I've got a whole bunch of female friends who are around my age, and they were incredibly judgmental. Like, they could not deal with me dating somebody that young. It's like, oh, my God, that's fucking disgusting. How could you do that? 
That is just disgusting. How could you do that? So here's what I wanted to do. Because there's a lot of you in this room, and you may know a middle-aged man going through this kind of a, a life crisis. So I want to explain to you the thought process behind a middle-aged man going out with a much younger woman so that if it happens in your life, you could deal with it through, uh, through reasoning and rationalism and, and love instead of through judgment. So here's the entire thought process for a middle-aged man dating a 20-year-old girl. And that thought process is, I deserve it. That's it. That's the entire thought process. <laughs> I want a fucking cookie. That is it. That is the entire process. And then, of course, we slept together and she started texting 300 times a day and I'm like, I deserve this. This is totally my fucking fault. I didn't even know how to break up with her. How do you even break up with somebody that... Yeah, I figured it out. You have to do it by text. I didn't even really break up with her. I just waited till she was texting a lot and then I typed in BRB and never fucking texted again. I'm pretty sure she thinks we're still going out. I, but here's the whole thing. I wanted to find somebody that's much more my speed, because I don't know if you could tell this about me. I'm a very old-fashioned guy. Can you tell that about me? I seem, I seem very old-fashioned, don't I? Yeah, so I wanted like something old-fashioned. And finally, it, it happened. I found somebody like very old-fashioned date. Dinner and a movie, old-fashioned. Is that like the most old-fashioned date ever? Yeah, right. yeah, like dinner and a movie. And here's how much it was old-fashioned. At the end of dinner and a movie, we actually walked through Central Park back to her, like walked and we held hands. Not even hold the hands. We linked pinkies. On our walk through center, that is old fashioned right there. Do you know? Let me just say this if you are linking pinkies, you are not exchanging any bodily fluid that evening, all right? <laughs> and then and, and she's right around my age, so when we get to her door, there's no game playing. I'm there like, I like you. I would like to see you again. And she's like, I like you. I want to see you again. And I went, let's make this happen. And then she reached into her purse and she pulled out a date book, made a paper. <laughs> do you have any idea how hot that is for a man my age? I'd have fucked her on the date book. That is how hot that is. Like, put that on the ground. We need the cushioning right now. Go! Make an appointment to see each other again. Have a nice little goodnight kiss. I go home. Very old-fashioned date. Perfect, or so I think, till three and a half hours later at 1.30 in the morning when my text message goes off, and it's her, and she sends me a message that says, send me a picture of your dick. To which I replied, No because she was not as nearly old-fashioned as I thought. <laughs> you know, I said, no, she hadn't seen it yet in real life. It felt way too much like an audition. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I was going to send her in a picture of my dick, and she'd be like, hmm, next! That's what it felt like. <laughs> you want to know the real reason why I didn't send it in? I'll tell you why. Because I did not know what kind of a phone she had. Like, if she had an Android with a really big screen, I will send her a picture of my dick. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but if you got a little iPhone 4 with a three-and-a-half-inch screen, nothing looks big on an iPhone, sir. Let me just say this, ladies, if you ever ask for a guy for a picture of his dick and you've not yet seen it in real life, he's not going to send it to you. The best he's going to do is send you the picture of somebody else's much more impressive penis, which is exactly what I did in this situation. And she called me on it. She's like, that's not you. I'm like, how do you know? She goes, you're not black. I'm like, you don't know me. That is my big black dick. I got it off of eBay. All right, you guys have been a lot of fun. Have a good night. Jim Mendrinos, everybody.